So, the midterms are upon us. And um, for those of you who have been following this content for a while, you know that um, <laughs> I've been talking about this issue quite a bit. And uh, one of the primary things that I've been talking about is how much Western companies and the West have been benefiting from the war on Ukraine and how it's become a political football uh, where one side gets to use Ukraine as an issue against um, against the other, whether that be Republicans saying that you're not um, <laughs> anti-Ukraine enough or Democrats saying you're not pro-Ukraine enough. It is on the ballot. So, like, it's always funny. Like, I have a very specific set of detractors, both on Facebook and Twitter, who constantly tell me that Ukraine isn't an issue, or that I'm wrong about the issues involving Ukraine. And they never have any proof, and they always ignore proof. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty valuable to look at the proof. And so I figured I would go over some of this, you know, proof that Ukraine is being used as a key issue in the elections. Now, before I get started on that, I wanted to bring up Brushfire 2048. You can check out the book uh, link in the description. I'm going to do a comprehensive review on it next month. Um, but basically, uh, it's a sequel to a, a book by a guy who has sponsored my content before. And uh, the first one was pretty good. It's basically about how if you find out the truth about government overreach and uh, what they do, um, you know, behind closed doors, etc., uh, they're going to come after you. And um, it's a dystopian thriller kind of thing, uh, written f by an agorist for an agorist uh, perspective sort of thing. Picture like Heinlein-esque. Um, so that's uh, the thing that you can do to support me right now. If you want, uh, you can buy this book. Uh, and the more you buy it, the more likely he is to continue sponsoring my content. So, uh, if you've got a conspiracy theorist on your Christmas list, feel free to buy that for them. Um, anyway, uh, the um, first thing I want to get into is the sheer fucking amount that's being spent on these selections. And I call them selections because that's what they are. You know, the elites aren't going to let their entire bloody, brutal, millennia-old empire uh, crumble to the earth because you asked nicely enough. <laughs> it's not going to fucking happen. Like, their empire is going to keep on ticking on, just like it always has and it always will. And uh, there's not a way out of it that doesn't involve directly opposing their system. You can't use their system to fight their system. You cannot ask the warden for the keys to your cell. He will reject you at every advance that is um, inconvenient to his power. So, I've been talking about how the elections were um, projected to be $9.3 billion spent. Um, that's an old figure uh, from Open Secrets. And the new figure from Open Secrets is that the total cost of the 2022 state and federal elections uh, is projected to exceed... 16.7 billion dollars, folks. 16.7 billion dollars. Yo, the total cost of 2022 state and federal midterm elections, and this is just the midterms, yo, is projected to exceed 16.7 billion dollars, according to a new Open Secrets analysis. Federal candidates and political committees are expected to spend 8.9 billion, while state candidates, partly committees and ballot measure committees, are on track to raise 7.8 billion. Election-related spending at the federal level has already blown past the inflation-adjusted 2018 midterm record of 7.1 billion. State-level candidate, uh, part, uh, party committee, and ballot measure committee expenditures could surpass the estimated 2018 midterm spending record of 6.6 .6 billion adjusted for inflation. So that makes it a total cost of 16.7 billion dollars, folks. 
I want you to keep that number in mind. I want you to think of everything that that could have been spent on. I want you to consider that, you know, all of the infrastructure projects, the homeless that the uh, federal government says could be housed for $20 billion, um, the, you know, massive infrastructure problems, the massive problems with like, you know, water pollution at Red Hill, Flint, Michigan, certain parts of Texas, all of Florida now that Ian hit, um, like, it's it's a terror zone in a variety of areas, and uh, the U.S. government is getting <laughs> $16.7 billion just to pick somebody who will only serve the agenda, who will only serve the elites at every single fucking turn. And I want you to keep that in mind for what I'm about to bring up. Because... Um, <laughs> the Ukraine issue is figuring very strongly in these midterm elections. And uh, here's an article that, uh, that I'm sort of ripping from foreign policy because uh, basically they, they're, um, they're a statist rag in a lot of ways, uh, which uh, I'm not going to financially support or give any data to. So I'm going to load this from an archive link. Um, so it's it's a little messy looking. But either way, um, how Ukraine figures in last minute midterm pitches. <laughs> it's like how Ukraine is being used as a political football. That's how you could rephrase this. Ahead of tomorrow's polls, foreign policy looms large in Virginia district seen as a bellwether for national trends. And it's not just about uh, Virginia either. It's, uh, so a DMV parking lot in Woodbridge isn't the sort of place you'd expect to see U.S. lawmakers talking about things like Ukraine or the expansion of NATO. But that's just what happened in the final days of midterm election cycle, uh, when Representative Abigail Spanberger made a stop at a polling station normally used for residents to renew their driver's licenses. The incumbent Democratic centrist in Virginia's 7th District used that time in part to tout her support for U.S. military aid to Ukraine. My opponent disagrees with me on the importance of supporting our allies, Spanberger said in the parking lot, surrounded by a small group of supporters as early voters streamed in and out of the polling station to cast their ballots. While I've been pushing to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs to win this war, my opponent has staunchly opposed aid to Ukraine. Polls show that Spanberger, a former CIA case officer, I'm sure that has nothing to do with her support for Ukraine, though. That the CIA was he heavily involved in the original training of who is leading the charges in Ukraine right now, and the CIA has been heavily involved in uh, what's currently going on there now as well, and she's, you know, <laughs> a former CIA case officer. Sure, it has nothing to do with that. But with that being said, she has a razor-thin lead over her Trumpist Republican challenger, Yesti Vega, an auxiliary deputy in the county sheriff's office in Virginia's Prince William County. In a hotly contested midterm election cycle, the race between the two is one of the most competitive, expensive, and closely watched nationally. Each campaign and party political action committee has dropped some $26 million into the race. It's a litmus test for how well Democrats can endure a projected surge of voter support for Republicans. It's also an early indicator of how much staying power the Trumpist flank of the Republican Party has among independent voters in background states. And it's a microcosm of how foreign policy issues are influencing the midterms, even as they take a backseat to other pressing issues such as the economy, health care, and abortion. More Virginia, right? And I just want you to think about this. I want you to think about how 
Virginia is huge in terms of elections. And that this is the issue that they're using last minute as their way to persuade people. Speaking to voters and reporters, Spanberger hammered home her national security credentials, including her time as a CIA case officer working on counterterrorism. Quote, Much of my national security work in Congress is focused on working with both parties to respond to emerging threats. <sighs> the Democrats have taken a political beating on the domestic front with inflation, surging energy prices, and looming fears of a recession, as well as on the foreign policy front after the debacle of Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan and an increasing number of voters questioning Biden's decision to send billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars to Ukraine to aid its war against Russia. I wonder why they would be pissed about that when there's so much wrong here and when there was recently a massive fucking hit to the economy because of their lockdown policies that they forced on people and that Republicans overwhelmingly opposed. I wonder why they would suddenly dislike the U.S. sending a bunch of money to Ukraine instead of using it domestically. Hmm, really boggles the noggle, don't it? While a bulk of Republican lawmakers support sending military aid to Ukraine, a small but vocal faction of Trump Republicans are increasingly speaking out against it, and Republican voters across the country are starting to agree. A new poll conducted by the Wall Street Journal found that 48% of Republicans now believe the United States is doing too much to help Ukraine, up from 6% up from, from a poll in March shortly after the war broke out. <laughs> there you go. That says it all right there, is that it's rapidly ramping up in increasing support for not being this close to Ukraine. Even this article, which is heavily promoting the CIA, even this article, which wants you to believe that supporting Ukraine is a good thing, they still say that it's a fucking problem. So maybe it's a fucking problem. And while I'm at it, let's talk about, because this is an investment, keep in mind. These people who are throwing these billions of dollars, like over $10 billion at these elections, they're not the common person for a significant chunk of the part. They're wealthy donors. And those wealthy donors are doing it for a reason. And the reason that they're doing it is because it boosts their fucking wealth. And in this particular case, uh, the warfare and intelligence state is being very, very well off during a uh, lockdown-inspired uh, recession. Um, because... They are supporting Ukraine, and they are supporting the candidates who will support Ukraine. And in over 80% of elections, um, the person who gets the most money uh, spent on their campaign wins, according to Open Secrets. That's something that I've brought up in previous videos. Subscribe if you want more of that. Um, also feel free to sign up for Presearch. They're sponsoring Agris Nexus, the outlet I write for now, and if you sign up free using the referral link in the description, um, you're going to support what we do there. But basically, um, that is the reason why the, uh, Ukraine situation is being used for such high spending as, uh, the Pentagon being expected, uh, or expecting Congress to provide wartime purchasing power for Ukraine. They want an amendment to the NDAA. Bill LaPlante, the Pentagon's chief weapons buyer, said that he expects Congress to grant the authority to allow wartime purchasing power at a level not seen since the Cold War, Defense News reported on Monday. To continue arming Ukraine, LaPlante has been calling for the Pentagon to be granted the authority to 
lock in multi-year contracts for weapon purchases, which are typically reserved for procuring naval vessels and warplanes. The idea is to get arms makers the incentive to ramp up production. You're not seeing this yet, you're blind. That's what I'm saying. If you're not seeing this yet, you're blind. The Senate has added an amendment to its version of the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act to grant the authority. It would allow the Pentagon to make multi-year purchases through 2023 and 24 of certain arms made by Lockheed Martin BAE System, Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace, and Raytheon, the former employer of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. The, se the Senate is expected to vote on its version of the NDAA sometime this month, and it will then negotiate the final version of the spending bill with the House. LaPlante expects the wartime purchasing powers to make it into the finalized version that will reach President Biden's desk. They're supportive of this. They're going to give us multi-year authority, and they're going to give us funding to really put into the industrial base, and I'm talking billions of dollars into the industrial base, to fund these production lines, LaPlante said on Friday. That, I predict, is going to happen, and it's happening now, and the people will have to say, I guess they were serious about it, but we have not done that since the Cold War, LaPlante said. Fucking fuck! We're going back to the Cold War, guys. And potentially much worse now. And certainly much worse for your liberties because they kept a lot of the Cold War legislation and they're adding more with facial recognition surveillance, the ID uh, hooked up to your blockchain payment system, the new social credit system, and all of this being connected to your accounts, which is something you can find out with Fido uh, video that I put out the other day. So you can read more in this article. You can read more in that article, and you can read this article by Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute about how American arms ma makers are cashing in on the war in Ukraine. He says, The war in Ukraine has spurred European countries to seek hundreds of billions in new weapons. American arms manufacturers are the biggest beneficiaries of the increased demand for weapons, according to a Yahoo News report. Ian Bond, director of foreign policy at the Center for European Reform, described the surge in the market for weapons as the highest since the Cold War. Quote, this is certainly the biggest increase in defense spending in Europe since the end of the Cold War, he said. Melissa Rossi wrote in Yahoo that American companies have, quote, been the biggest beneficiary of the demand. Members of the European Union have planned to increase their defense budgets by 230 billion motherfucking dollars, led by Germany's pledge to increase military spending by 100 cunt-sucking billions. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, European governments got most of their weapons from American weapon makers! The American weapons industry is defined by the revolving door. The revolving door refers to the phenomenon of U.S. military officials retiring and taking jobs on the boards of corporations that produce arms. Current Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was a general before retiring and joining the board of Raytheon. After a short stint as a weapons executive, Austin now heads the Pentagon and helps craft America's foreign policy. Austin's predecessors, Jim Mattis and Mark Esper, also served on the boards of weapon, weapons makers. The U.S. is the globe's largest arms seller, distributing 39% of the world's weapons from 2017 to 22. American companies accounted for over half of all arms sales in Europe. SIPRI reports show the Netherlands, UK, Poland, and France list the US as their top destination for weapons, with Amsterdam spending 94% of its procurement budget at American companies. Senior researcher with the SIPRI Arms and Military Expenditures Program, Pieter Wesman, told Yahoo, many European countries have plans to increase their military spending very significantly and to increase their purchases of arms as part of that. 
Weapons sales now show no signs of slowing down. Bulgaria's legislature approved a plan to buy 70 of Lockheed Martin's F-16s for $1.3 billion. Last week, the U.S. State Department approved a $500 million missile sale to Finland. William Hartung, an analyst at Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, told Yahoo the weapons sales are growing at a rapid clip. Washington has said it will support Ukraine for as long as it takes and does not plan to push Kiev to seek a diplomatic end to the war. An extended conflict is expected to be a major boon for American arms makers. So when people tell me that this isn't a fucking issue, or that it's an internet issue, or that it doesn't actually matter, or that I'm a Russian bot for suggesting that maybe we shouldn't be ramping up global arms productions, um, benefiting the military-industrial complex most chiefly domestically so that their things do great, while the S&P and Dow tank because of an economy they fucked, maybe that pisses me off a bit. And you know what else pisses me off? The fact that I'm called a Russian bot all the time uh, by people who believe garbage propaganda like this, which came up, which is absolutely hilariously, hilariously propagandistic. So if you look at this post, it's from the New York Times, and the guy posting it is propagandist Seth Abramson. And he says, confirmed, Russia's interfering in the midterms to aid GOP candidates due to their support for the Kremlin and opposition to continued funding for Ukraine. Newly declared hot Russian cyber war means a red vote on Tuesday really is a vote for Russia. And so people are saying that um, Ukraine isn't an issue or that Ukraine isn't the issue. Ukraine is the issue and people are using it against Russia because it makes them tens and hundreds of billions of fucking dollars. So, what is this proof he's got? Well, if you look at these articles, they say nothing. And so, they say, the user on Gab who identifies as Nora Burka resurfaced in August after year-long silence on the social media platform, reposting a handful of messages with sharply conservative political themes before writing a stream of original vitriol. So, this is from the author Stephen Lee Myers, who has re reported from Russia and China, writes about misinformation, and is based in San Francisco. The post mostly denigrated President Biden and other prominent Democrats, sometimes obscenely. They also lamented the use of taxpayer dollars to support Ukraine in its war against invading Russian forces, depicting Ukraine's president as a caricature straight out of Russian propaganda. Yeah, because Americans never do any sort of propaganda or caricature. It's not like you could, you know, not get away with the same kinds of political cartoons that were posted during World War II and their discussions of, you know, the Japanese um, these days without being accused of anti-Asian hate crimes. It's not like you could, you know, <laughs> fucking uh, post the, uh, the, the kinds of things that were posted during the Civil War about the slaves um, and not get accused of being a racist because these things were massively racist. The U.S. is a uh, propagandistic, jingoistic, um, racist piece of shit government. Um, and it always has been, and it always will be, and they always will invoke propaganda because that's how they fucking operate. And they have ever since, uh, fucking, uh, <laughs> ever since the Torches of Freedom campaign written by the guy who really wrote the book on propaganda, if you know what I'm saying. Oh man, this it's just such a frustratingly thick layer of propaganda here, but let's, let's continue here. A fusion of political concerns was no coincidence. The account was previously linked to the same secretive Russian agency that interfered in the 2016 presidential election and again in 2020. Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, according to the cybersecurity group Recorded Future. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. And then you go to this thing to find out what those links are, the interfered and again links, and it's just, oh, they fucking made social media posts. That's all they fucking did. They made social media posts that made Westerners sad uh, here and here. That's all they did. And these people are saying they interfered in the election? Okay. 
why don't we talk about the U.S. then? Why don't we talk about the variety of U.S. Uh, sponsored um, radio uh, programs around the world? Why don't we talk about Radio Free Anything, including Radio Free Svoboda in fucking Ukraine, which has always taken the Western side and always snowed uh, the criticism of Azov and C-14 and Right Sector and Patriot of Ukraine and anyone that can make Western involvement, funding, and training seem <laughs> less severe than it was. Why don't we talk about the fact that every single time the U.S. wants to interfere in some other country, they can do it? Why don't we talk about the fact that Ukraine is currently nationalizing any business that doesn't toe the Ukrainian nationalist line, and that if that was a communist country doing it for communist reasons, they would interfere, just like they did with Allende, uh, Allende in fucking, uh, you know, this, the, the situation where they literally staged a coup to overthrow him. Why don't we talk about, you know, the Iran-Contra affair, where the Contras were literally political muscle in the region to support Western right-wing agendas, or the Pinochet situation, where he was literally throwing people out of helicopters because he got in on U.S. election interference, or just a long list of fucking uh, fascist policies the U.S. has been part of either instating or supporting because they're fascist and because that's why they've been supporting Nazis since, you know, the origination of NATO with their commanders in there, including the Bundeswehr, and with the CIA originally involved in the Galen organization with Reinhard Galen's Nazi spies. Why don't we talk about that? The Mujahideen, another right-wing network used against Russia. Why don't we talk about the fact that the Bundeswehr and the, um, and the fucking uh, Galen organization were both against Russia? Why don't we talk about that being against Russia has been a political football since before the Cold War even fucking began, and the Cold War was a direct result of brinksmanship that was the result of the U.S. doing this sort of thing on a regular fucking basis. But it only matters now because Russia has apparently hired some people to post on GAB! Oh, it's, in, it's, it's, it's deeply frustrating. It's deeply frustrating that this is not taken more seriously. It's deeply frustrating that this is not considered a more serious issue. And it's deeply frustrating that people don't see that this is what the midterms are, that this is what politics are these days, is are you commie? Are you Russia? Are you with the West? Are you an ally or are you our enemy? Are you going to serve our interests and continue allowing us to make hundreds of billions of dollars? Weapons manufacturers beseech the American public. Are you going to continue towing the line and supporting our agenda while we fuck you domestically, while we take your fucking freedom and throw it in the incinerator while we, you know, <laughs> throw lockdowns and fucking aggressive surveillance and censorship policies everywhere we fucking go. Are you going to continue supporting us or are you going to flip us the middle finger and tell us that we need to fuck off? Because that's the issue. That's the reason democracy is on the ballot is what these people are saying because they want you to believe that you chose this. They want you to believe that it's your fault. They want to gas Gaslight you and tell you that this agenda that they've been building for centuries is you. This is you. This is your choice. You voted this. You did this. And if you don't continue to support us, you're going to fuck everything up. You, not us. Don't blame us, the tens of billions heirs. Don't blame us and the people who are slowly stealing all the land with our ill-gotten money. Don't blame us and the people who are funding the mega-corporate fascist billionaire state. Don't blame us. Blame you. Blame you for not supporting Ukraine enough, you Russian Kremlin bot paid Vladimir Putin troll, uh, fucking <laughs> evil piece of shit commie, um degenerate Republican GQP insurrectionist, do all of that. You know, do all of that or you're all of those evil things that we say you are. You are our puppet, and if you disagree, we will own you, and we will own everything, and you will own nothing, and you will be happy. And that is why we need to learn 
everything about this structure and oppose everything about this structure and everything about Ukraine being used as a political football and say maybe the warfare state and the intelligence industrial complex is the problem here and not the common person and the, their voting habits. And voting isn't going to take us away from this situation. It's only going to deepen the pockets of billionaires. Why don't we say that and realize that the real truth is that we need to smash the fucking state.